Alright, welcome back and this is going to be the second video explaining dot point 6.2 which is using the electrochemical series to predict the products of electrolysis. In this video I will be looking at the use of reactive electrodes. We're still going to keep the condition to be SLC using aqueous electrolytes. So the only difference between this video and the previous one is that instead of having the electrodes being um, inert, they are going to be reactive in this case. All right, so this is just a quick reminder of um, the three factors that may affect the products of electrolysis, type of electrodes, concentration of solution and reaction electrolyte. And the, the bit in star is what we're looking at for this video. Okay, so we only have two questions here and I'm going to just start with 4A, which is to determine the products from an H electrode of electrolytic cell, so that hasn't changed. And you're going, to, your electrolyte, once again, is an aqueous mixture of nickel nitrate and zinc bromide. You know that it's still SLC because the concentration is 1.0. And the electrodes are no longer inert, they are now made of copper. You still assume, oh, actually, I think I've changed this question. You're supposed to assume that nitrate is a spectator ion. So I'm going to edit that in the um, in the question. Okay, so let's go back to this one. So that's supposed to say nitrate as well, even though I'm just going to edit the PowerPoint. All right, so let's go through the steps again. Um, we're going to list the species present. So we have an electrolyte which contains nickel nitrate. So there is nickel nitrate, IQ, and zinc, that's, a, that's supposed to be a Q, zinc bromide, IQ. So the species present, in this case, you have nickel iron, zinc iron, nitrate ions, which is a spectator ion, so we're not going to have to worry about. Bromide ion, water, and because your electrodes are reactive, because they're made of copper and not inert, you also have to take them into account. So copper is going to be one of the species present. Okay, next thing is to look at the oxidizing and reducing agents that have contact with the um, anode and cathode. Anything that is in uh, the electrolyte is going to have access to both the cathode and the anode because the cathode and anode are submerged in the solution. And because copper acts as both the cathode and anode, copper will also have access to cathode and anode. So every species here you need to highlight in using your electrochemical series. Okay, so we have nickel ions and zinc ion is here and water. So there are three oxidizing agents present that have access to the cathode. Um, I'm not going to ignore nitrate because it's spectator. There's water here, there's bromide iron here, and there is copper here. So you have three um, reducing agents as well. And then you have to identify the strongest oxidizing and reducing agents that will react. Or in other words, you need to form the smallest Z. So in this case, the reaction actually will happen between nickel ions and copper. So the anode, it's going to actually get dissolved because the actual anode is turning into copper ions and the nickel ions on the other side is producing nickel. So um, reduction, it's going to be, so we're just going to focus on this one and the copper. The reduction is nickel ion. Gaining two electrons to go to nickel and oxidation is copper going to copper iron and two electrons. So the products that you get is you're going to have nickel at the cathode and copper ions produced at the anode. So that's part A. Very simple, actually very, very similar to the previous case when you have inert electrodes. The only exception here is that you have to remember to consider the electrodes as well. Okay, let's look at part B. Predict any change to the products formed at the electrodes of the cell from part A if the anode is replaced with an inert carbon electrode. So let, let me just draw this one out. So you have a power supply 
and you have a mixture of two ionic solutions. This is this would be so much faster as I'm doing it on a whiteboard, but not complaining. I'm just I don't know. What is what is that? Okay. I need a bigger desk. I ordered a desk from Kmart two weeks ago and heard nothing from them. I had to call them. And now the, that particular desk is sold out online, so I think they just don't have any stock. I cannot believe this. I two or two days delivery or something. It's okay if you don't have stock. What can you like tell me? Okay. So the solution is nickel nitrate zinc bromide and water. So we have minus here positive. This is going to be your cathode because it is connected to the negative terminal of the power supply. And because this is a similar to part A, so the cathode is still iron and the anode is now replaced. So the anode is inert. So one of the re um, electrodes is a reactive electrode, but the other one is inert. So the question is, would this change anything? So we go back to the steps again. So if I list everything present um, for the third time in two minutes, I have nickel ions, nitrate, zinc, bromide, water, and copper. And I'm, I'm going to think about the next step now. So highlight all the oxidizing agents that have contact with the cathode. So that hasn't changed. You still have nickel iron, you still have zinc ions, and you still have water. Because these three are still in the electrolyte, so they should still have access to the cathode. The one thing that may change, though, is the, is the species that actually have access to the anode. So um, bromide iron is there, water is there, but it's actually going to be wrong to highlight copper in this case because of where it is. I don't know why I wrote Fe here, I suppose it's copper. Um, so in part A, there was a copper cathode and a copper anode. So because copper was the anode in part A, of course it has access to the anode. But if you look at this particular cell right now, there is copper, yes, but copper access the cathode and it is physically impossible for this substance to come into contact with the anode. So even though copper is present, it cannot undergo oxidation in this case because it's acting as the site of reduction. This is a very, very important point. If your reactive metal is the cathode, it's not going to be able to undergo oxidation. So copper is the cathode. That would be impossible unless there is a spontaneous reaction, but still it cannot undergo. It's very difficult for a material to undergo oxidation if electrons are physically being forced into it. Undergo oxidation. Okay, so even though copper is present, I actually cannot highlight it. So it's not going to be able to join the competition and um, get reacted at all. So the, the smallest Z that I can form in this case is going to be between nickel ions and bromide ions. So there will be a change. My reaction at the cathode stays the same, but my reaction at the anode is going to change. So reduction is still nickel ions plus two electrons going to nickel. But the reaction at the anode is now going to be the oxidation of bromide ions. Br2. So the moral of the story is when you have reactive electrodes, you need to really think about whether that electrode is the cathode and the anode and whether or not that substance has access to what it needs to undergo the type of um, have reactions that it needs to. That's a very roundabout way of saying you probably should draw the diagram and think about does, does the species you're about to underlie have access to the cathode or the anode. That is it for this video.